I'm Kim Bailey, she's Fuliana Osborne and this is Inside Exec. Today we're going to go back to basics and Fuliana and I are going to talk a little bit about how we see mentoring and how you can take on mentors for yourself, how you choose them, how you categorise them, how you use them, how long you use them for, all those sorts of things. We don't want you to feel that we're producing these podcasts for big corporate organisations or your your place in big corporate organisations. We understand that we do have lots of people following us who are not in that situation, who have businesses of their own, who are placed in all sorts of different roles, both in business and in community organisations. So we want you to be aware of the opportunities that are out there for you to engage with mentors that are not necessarily part of a planned, programmed approach. For my intro, I really would like you to start thinking about the mentors that you have had across your adult life. You know, obviously you would have had them as a child, but they're perhaps not so influential these days. But certainly in your adult life, you would have had mentors that you didn't identify with the capital M mentor phrase, but people that you turned to when you wanted clarification, people who you used as a sounding board, people that provided you with better ways of doing things, of looking at situations. And they might have been short, long term, they might be ones that you still have around, but they're all mentors in some way. And and you can have good and bad mentors. You know, my partner is very big on saying about particular people that he will categorise them as a bad mentor. And or no, he doesn't say they're a bad mentor, he says Everyone is a mentor in some way, they just teach me different things. So it's a, it's a bit more positive way of putting it, but, but definitely he will categorise everyone as a mentor in a situation. That's a, a pretty good way of looking at the people that you're interacting with all the time. But often you'll decide that you need some more specialised assistance or help or easing through a situation, and so you identify or you try to identify someone or something that can help you. And there I will also talk about the fact that at this time we have so much more opportunity to find mentors anywhere in the world using any medium to communicate with us. They don't have to be ones that we work one-on-one with, but we might find someone who produces a podcast, who produces a video series, who has webinars, that strike a chord with you, that help you through these areas or through this path that you're looking to. So they don't, again for me, they don't have to be individual people that you know specifically, but they are providing a mentoring service in that they are helping you along your journey. If we take this a step further as well, we talked about definitions of mentors um, in other podcasts as well. We hear terms like mentors, coach sponsor sometimes and now we have accountability partner and accountability partner that's right so if you look at at those they all mean different things to different people so let's keep it simple and say you want someone to help you grow now when i say grow it could be in your career it could be in your life it could be in sport whatever it may be so look around you as kim said you can have someone even remotely and use the new technology. But let's take, first of all, people within the organisation. You will see different people that you know they've got a good reputation or they known and respected for a particular skill. And that skill, I'm not talking technical at the moment, I'm talking about a leadership trait, that they seem to be popular with others in a good way, they can make a hard decision. Some things that you want to grow within your own leadership style. It would be good if you could have some connection with that person. Don't be afraid to ask. People are usually uh, flattered if you ask them to you know, share their experience and be part of your growth journey. Be respectful of what you're asking and be respectful of their time, obviously have that person that you identified. Another way is to say, I'm looking for someone who would help me, but there's no one internally, the same sort of thing. Maybe you know someone who knows someone else. Now, we're well connected through many media these days, and you've got your own networks. And 
through your network. It might be someone that you don't work with, that you, it's not even in the same industry or in the sports arena or in the golf, um, where, where you play golf or, or whatever. Find that person. Don't think one mentor, one size fits all either. You pick the person that you, you might have 20 fantastic people that you could call on, but you want to pick the one that you actually can have chemistry with, that you can connect with, and that makes a big difference. And if that is not working for your sake and the mentor's sake, walk away. The other thing is to say, maybe I want something specific, so I need a coach. Now, a coach is... I want to learn how to write the best business plan or I want to talk how to talk in public or whatever that is. Find the specialists in, in that regard. Find them, again, through your network, through known, proven performance, etc. A sponsor, however, is someone that can be there and they will champion your work. They will encourage you. They are in a position to say look, I know a person in such and such area or in such and such company that can do such and such really, really well. They helped me with something or they did that with somebody I know. So they speak for you either within or outside the organization. So find them and you're not being greedy by having more than one mentor, more than one sponsor and more than one coach. The other area that we need to stress is about the fact that you are selecting this person. You're choosing. It's not the case where you identify that you would benefit from having a mentor and then you look online or you seek out another person and the fact that, that someone's been recommended to you or an organisation, a, a mentoring group says, you know, we'll find you the right person. You're still the one that's making the selection. You're still the one that needs the to have the right fit, the right mix of qualities and interaction and communication and all of those things. So you need to be clear about what you want from the mentoring situation and then go out and select accordingly and remember that you're always in the driving seat. And I think it's really a good idea to have more than one because it, it makes you focus less on getting all of the answers from one place, which leads me then to reminding you of that a mentor is not someone who's going to tell you what to do. They're not going to have all the answers for you. They're the things that you need to work out yourself, but they might well be able to show you a path that will help you to find those answers and be a sounding board for when you think you've found the answers and you just want to talk it through. Being clear not only about what you want from a mentor, but what you think you will gain by the mentor experience is important in the selection process. That's a good point about the mentor giving you all the answers. The other one don't pick just a fan, someone who will agree with you and tell you what you want to hear. That's not really going to cut it because at the end of the day, you want someone, for example, as we said, there's someone you're thinking aloud with. So you are thinking aloud and you say, look, I had this situation where I had an interaction with someone, I had a very unpleasant day and this is how it went. And you want the person at the end of it say, in some cases, if that was appropriate, that the way you spoke or the way you handled it or the way you reacted, you might want to think about another strategy for next time. In other words, the way you handled it wasn't the best way. No matter how angry or upset you are, the person is not there just to comfort you. Yes, they get the, the most important thing is that they have your best interest at heart and they're only interested in making things better for you, but not by agreeing with you if you need to be put to your attention that the way you handle things, you would have had a better outcome if you looked at a number of other options. Just go back a step to selecting a mentor. I think it's probably important for us to remind you that not everyone will say yes, and they won't say yes for a range of reasons. Perhaps they've never been asked before, Perhaps they don't see themselves in that role, they're not comfortable with themselves in that role. Perhaps it might take more than just asking them. Perhaps you need to tell them what you think they can give you that they might not have identified in themselves. You need to be prepared for refusal as well as acceptance. And that all comes back to being very prepared about what you're asking of this potential mentor and what you've identified 
as their ability to contribute to the outcome that you're looking for. How do you know then, let's say you, you've done all of that and you've got the mentor and things were going all right, how do you know when that's it, it served its purpose, it's enough? I think you both can, but if you're looking at traditionally, you know, some some mentoring relationship formally goes for 6 to 12 months and then after that becomes a different relationship or it just becomes I see you when I see you. So don't hang on to that as a dependence and don't continue going over random and random and circles once you reach somewhere. Then you move on, find a different mentor, and let the mentor go and mentor other people as well. Which is fascinating, because before we started doing this series, I would have thought that a mentoring relationship goes on forever. And the more I've heard the people who are involved with it day to day, the more I understand that that's actually not how they see the process, and that they do see it as finite time relationships, and after that it changes to something else. So I have learned something myself through these podcasts. I think this is a good time to just, again, wrap up about the three roles, is that the, the roles don't have to be all in one person. It doesn't have to be through a formal program. It doesn't have to be internal or external. It doesn't have to be one only. So you look, just like with everything else, make sure that if you go through an organisation that match you to a mentor, make sure their organisation is reputable. And as Kim said, you're very clear about what you're looking for in there and make sure that it is delivering on what you want. And if it's not, you don't have to keep going with the arrangement. But if you're doing things remotely, again, be careful about the claims of people. In most cases, like in, in Kim and in my case, we are just sharing our own thoughts and experiences. We're not trying to be gurus on any topic. So... If you want a specialist, then when you go to specific coaching, that would be, again, it might be a technical skill you're trying to learn. So when you're searching for that, then you perhaps could go to an organisation with, again, make sure it's reputable and make sure that they have a good track record and references check. It's about, particularly with the coaching, you need to look at how you learn best just in the last 24 hours. I've had an experience of someone who asked me for some advice, for some information and steps on the way to do a particular task. And I thought that the return for both of us in me putting down on paper or in an email how that this task should be carried out was going to be too labour intensive and not the right way for this person to learn. You know, the, essentially they were asking for instructions and I know from my interaction with them that the best way they learn is not by the written instruction, but by actually seeing something being done. So I resorted to YouTube, and I looked it up on YouTube, and, and in my response I just said, look, basically all you need are these tools, but to actually see how it's done, go to YouTube, search for this. And the response I got back was, I had never thought of that. I had never thought of going there to look for it, and yes, they do have everything, and I'll come back to you if I have any specific technical issues that I need addressed. So that was a good resolution without me having to be too hands-on in that management situation. The other thing that I'd like to clarify is the difference between mentoring and having an accountability partner, because that's something new that we've introduced. And I can see herself laughing on the other side of the table here because that's something that she does, so she has to talk, I don't. <laughs> accountability partner. Well, OK, we're talking about senior people, particularly private run companies, small family business. In that sort of structure, there isn't really a board, there isn't anything to make that owner accountable to. My experience has been is this sort of organisation, they're very, very, very good at what they do and, in fact, very impressive leadership skills, so how they treat their people, etc. So when they were talking about a potential mentor, I didn't actually feel that they needed a mentor as such as they seemed to have everything covered and been in business for a long time. So what they're really looking for is someone to help them stick to their goals that they come up with a strategy, they come up with the ideas, they come up with what's the priority and someone to hold them accountable to, to those decisions or the goals they set, I should say. 
And that actually goes al- along the total spectrum of their business and life without being into a psychologist sort of situation. It's saying, okay, I want to concentrate a bit more on work and life balance or I want to have exercise. So as an example, you say, okay, so realistically, how much time do you think you'll be able to to allocate to that, and realistically they'll come up with a, a number, you know, hour or whatever. How are you going to do that? And it might be swimming, cycling, walking, running. Once they make that decision, then you'll say, all right, so it's in their diary every so-and-so, and, and this is how long. And you hold them accountable to it because it was made, the decision was made, yes, it's a priority, it is doable, and it's a realistic time in a realistic time frame and amount. So, you're doing that on one hand. On the other hand, you're saying the the person might say, "What's happening to me is I'm spending far far too much time with my people, which I do not want to diminish their relationship and their caring and their investment in my people. But I'm finding that I can only start doing my other work late at night, and so." revisit that, talk it through and say, okay then, what's realistic without skimping on your decision how you want to be as a leader? Likewise, is it being out with the clients, which is at that level and in that sort of situation, that's mainly where the time goes and where it should go. So then, how is the work allocated and what are you doing in relation to keeping on the task? In a way, it's a bit like saying, no, I'm sorry, I will not have any excuses. You said you're going to do that. You're going to do it unless something out of the ordinary has happened. It's got to be an exception, a real exception. And I would never have thought that there would be a need for something like that. But I'm finding that according to the people who are using that service, they are and they are getting the value out of it. To me, if that works and it helps, then that's fine. So having said that at the space I mentioned, you think about it on where you are. Maybe your accountability partner could be one of your peers at work. Maybe that is a weakness of maybe it's a bit harsh to call it a weakness, but if in, it's an area where you've got the right goals but you, you need somebody to drive you because your other well-meaning things like helping colleagues and will chew up your time. So you get an accountability partner. That person could be at work or outside work. It could be a peer. It could be anyone else in the organisation. So the, the concept seem to work. And it's not someone who's just checking up on you. If you're in a situation where you're looking at your fitness and you go to the gym, that you will see that there are lots of people who go to the gym who can just go and do their exercise and leave. There are others who do their exercise and after every part of the circuit, if they're using the machines, they'll put their results into their little app or their phone or onto the machine for in some cases. And, the, and so the, the reporting is their accountability partner in that sense. And there are others who need a personal trainer. They need someone who checks on what they're doing, rewards them for the effort that they're putting in, but shows them the path to continue moving in the direction of the goal that they have set for themselves. So if we can see it just in that simple situation of, of a gym, then it's, it's going to be equally as important in our work situations. Well, I think we've probably covered the basics of how we see mentoring and coaching and sponsorship and accountability. And I hope that that's made it a little clearer for you. I'm Kim Bailey, she's for Diana Osborne, and this is Inside Exec.